Let's go. There's the spot, Watson. By night, Goulston Street is deathly silent, which will permit us to carry out a fair few experiments. Let's find the entrance where the piece of the victim's apron and the mysterious chalk message were found. Look at these signs, Watson. We are in the Jewish High Street. Look at these signs, Watson. We are in the Jewish High Street. There's the spot where the apron and the message were found by PC Long. Now, let's recreate the scene. Remember, Watson, it was raining that night. Find me something with which to mimic raindrops hitting this wall while I write something with my chalk. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. But what does it mean? Have you found something for us to pour water from, Watson? Find a container and some water. Let me remind you that it's night time and the street is deserted, Holmes. That may come in handy, who knows? An old wooden pole. A merchant probably threw it out. That may come in handy, who knows? A watering can, that's what I need, but I can't reach it. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. But what does it mean? Yes, I have, Holmes. A 
If this message were written by the killer, then it would have been lying in this entrance for up to 35 minutes before being discovered. Let's find out in what state it must have been. This message could not have withstood an entire night in the rain. During the investigations carried out on the night of the double murder, PC Hulse inspected the entrances of this street around 2.20 a.m. and confirmed to have seen nothing out of the ordinary. At 2.55 a.m., 35 minutes later, PC Long found Catherine Edow's piece of apron and the message in chalk. This message would not have withstood a whole night in the rain, as had I continued to water it for a little longer, I would certainly have erased it. It was written, therefore, at the moment when the piece of apron was dumped. This substantiates P.C. Hulse's statement, which stated he had seen neither of these during his rounds. After its discovery, it was guarded and protected from the rain, which was subsiding, which explains why it was still legible when it was erased at half five. My dear Watson, when you met P.C. Smith on his rounds in the street, where was he? On the pavement or in the middle of the road? In the middle of the road, Holmes, without a shadow of a doubt. Good. You'll go down the street with your lantern as if you were a policeman on patrol, using Smith's position as a guide. As soon as you see the entrance where I used the watering can, tell me if you see anything. There, Holmes. From here, I can see something written. Can you read it? No. Do you see the white rag, Watson? I see something on the ground, but I'm not sure if it's what you were talking about. P.C. Long, who found the piece of apron, was examining the interior of the entrances, and yet nobody would have predicted that this piece of material would be discovered on the very night of the murder by a policeman on patrol. What are you trying to get at, Holmes? Let's look at this message on the wall, Watson. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. In other words, the Jews were possibly blamed for nothing, but that will no longer be the case. Reading this message naturally begs one question. What would that be, Watson? Why? Indeed, Watson, why? For what reason would one have the right to blame the Jews in the future? Remember, Liz Stride was killed near a club for socialist Jews, Edows not far from a synagogue and the Imperial Club, and finally, this piece of apron dropped here. This building is occupied by Jewish families. The killer really did go out of his way to incriminate the Jews living in the area. It's a bit obvious, Holmes. Yes, but with the rumours, Watson, the author of this message would have received a response to his strategy. You are right, Holmes. So perhaps it's a good thing this message was erased. Whoever took the decision to do this is a man of great wisdom and courage. Let's return to Baker Street, Watson. I have some pipes to smoke to help me think more clearly. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home sweet home. I had nightmares all night, Holmes. As for you, I bet you didn't get a wink of sleep, did you? It's this chalk message business, isn't it? Among other things. And this lunatic is still running free. If only we knew what he looked like. But we do know, Watson. We have a fairly accurate description. I must have missed an episode of your adventures, Holmes. Not only have I heard you discredit the value of our eyewitnesses, but the few descriptions we do have don't seem to correspond. An inaccurate account can regain its value if we can discover why and what extent the truth must be rewritten. We've learned a great many things tonight, and I'm able to tell you what our man looks like. Really? Yes, and we're going to need a few things, Watson. Find me three mannequins, my worker's costume, my three full wigs, one of your worn garments, yes, that can be used for the workman's outfit, and one of your old suits. Oh, and my deer stalker, the one I never wear, but everyone seems to think I wear day and night.
We shall place our mannequins here, Watson. A wig. This will come in handy. So, as for one of the murders, we have no witnesses whatsoever. As for the three other, we have at least one person who claims to have seen the victims talking to a man a few minutes before their death. Do you remember whom these would be, Watson? Bravo, Watson. There are our three witnesses. There is an error, Watson. Let's reread Abraham's testimony. Perfect, Watson. 
Indeed, Watson, that's the right size for Abraham's mannequin. The account given by Mr. Solomonovich's friend is incorrect in at least one point. The first Joseph said that the man was at least five foot seven inches tall. The second Joseph said he was three inches taller than the victim, whom we know was five feet tall, which would suggest a height of five foot three inches. Don't forget that it was this second Joseph who attracted his friend's attention towards the couple on the other side of the road. We can assume he got a very good look at them. As for young P.C. Smith's account, he must have been mistaken about this person's real height. It is only an inch or two after all, and we can attribute the same height as the other two. Excellent. Now on to the next step. Bravo, Watson. Our mannequins have been recreated based on the correct accounts. Now, Watson, let's see in what ways these statements differ and how the witnesses could have been mistaken. Let's look at these wigs and moustaches. Let's start by taking the first Joseph's testimony, who saw the man head-on in a well-lit spot and in which he noted fair hair. Now, let's consider the same person, but in the lighting and angle of the other two witnesses, in the darkness of night, with poor artificial lighting from above. Put out the light, Watson. Thus, poor lighting and a backlit subject can affect our perception of shades and colours. The wigs from Abraham's mannequin took on the same colour as the other two. The three testimonies, therefore, don't contradict one another and we can apply the same facial hair to all three mannequins. Turn on the light, Watson. Yes, I have, Holmes. Well done, Watson. With regards to the murderer's hair, the three witnesses should agree on Abraham's testimony. As Joseph is the only one who saw our man in full light, his hair must therefore be fair. You see, Watson, it is hard to draw objective conclusions when one is an eyewitness to an event. This leads us to reconsider the various statements regarding the supposed age of the man. 
Even if you are face to face with someone in full light and for a period of several hours, to what extent can you determine their exact age? And even more so if you observe them for only a few seconds and or from behind. We must allow some flexibility when considering our witnesses' statements, but always scientific flexibility. Excellent. Now on to the next step. There we are, magnificent. There we are, magnificent. Yes, I have, Holmes. Now that we have fully considered the witness accounts, let's see to what extent they agree. If we apply the range of error for each of our dummies, we can deduce the age of our murderer as precisely as possible. Perfect, Watson. Within a margin of one year, Watson, the age of our murderer is 33 years. But the man described by Smith was dressed respectably, whereas the other two were poorly dressed. Indeed, but Whitechapel's respectively could quite easily describe the Sunday bests that all lower class men own. Now, let's place ourselves in the shoes of Liz Stride's killer. He has just slain his victim and sees Louis Diemschutz discover her body. Our killer is at great risk if he stays in the area. He therefore gets away from this spot. But he wants to kill again. However, he might have been spotted in the area before having committed the murder by a constable on his round, perhaps, who managed to get his description. What do you think the killer will do? Go back home or to a safe location, change his clothes and leave again in search of another victim. It's the only possible explanation, Watson. The man returned to the safety of his lodgings and then decided to go out again with new clothes and repeat his sinister nocturnal work. That's how the discrepancies between the witnesses with regards to clothing can be explained. What a cold-blooded animal! And what determination! Powerful motives are pushing this man. Thus, we can conclude that the respectable man with the package may very well have been seen by the two Josephs. Even if it is just a mannequin, it's giving me goosebumps. But have we really made any progress, Holmes? I mean, there must be thousands of men in Whitechapel who match this description, wouldn't you say? You're right, Watson. We have worked on who, now let's work on where. We need a map of Whitechapel, and please also find me a pencil, two compasses, one of which can draw ellipses. <laughs> 